and, and even then, at what level, too. So that's, that's critical. If, if parks are important, we got to hear that. So if, if we don't hear that, it's, it's only coming from a handful of people who will we'll fight really hard and try to make it. But it's more important and more impactful if we hear it from, from everybody who lives in the community. If lighting is an issue, well, let's emphasize lighting. If homelessness is an issue, we've got to create programs and, and different ways of addressing all of that. But if we don't hear it and it's only a handful of people, you know, it makes it harder. So we gotta, we got to be more active. And these conversations and these meetings are not exciting. As excited as we are, they're not exciting, really. Um, but they're important because they impact our everyday life. Uh, whether we like it or not. Um, so it's extremely important to be there and, and, and share what we think is important. And, and we're supposed to reflect that in policies. So, you know, I really invite you to be involved. You know, I'm going to do a shameful plug for Southeastern Planning Crew. We meet the second Monday of every month, of, 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 of the month at 6 o'clock um, at the neighborhood house, which is at 841. Um, South 41st Street. Um, the community plan update is being updated as we speak. We have about a year to go, and this is a huge area. Um, I've been involved, and I can, there's more people right now present that have been more involved in those decisions. So it's, it's critical to get more people. It's, it's, it's extremely important. So that's to me, that's the, the way these these plans, these dialogues are responsive to the community. And if it's only a handful of people that happens to be um, investors, outside investors, they come during these discussions and they influence, they're influencing the, the future. And their, their, their investment is different. Their, their priorities for the community are different. So they tend to be there, but not the people that live in the communities, not the renters um, happen to be there. So that discussion is a little bit skewed. Uh, I'll just add a little bit. You know, the good news is that I think there's growing awareness about gentrification. And, you know, for those of you who don't know what that term means, it's, it, what it means is that a neighborhood kind of lifts itself up from the lower levels, and the people who live there, who have lived there for a long time, can no longer afford to live there anymore. And so they kind of get pushed out, and kind of a new group of people come in. You often hear about, oh, it's the new hip neighborhood. And so suddenly you have this new wave of people that's, well, wait a minute, we were trying to improve this neighborhood for the people that are living there right now. So as Georgette described, I think, I think there's a growing awareness. That's the good news. The, the tough part about it is how do you actually do that? You know, when you have the affordable housing and the subsidies, it's pretty easy for government to put regulations to keep things at a certain level. But we're not country who believes in rent control or artificial controls. And so it's a tough conversation, but it's an incredibly important conversation uh, as we improve our neighborhoods. Because we're trying to improve it for the people that are there today, not for that the next group that wants to move in uh, and take advantage of all that. So. So, um, we'll take one more question. The, uh, the library actually has a door, its doors at 8, so we need to get up and out. Uh, So all they can do is really 
identify solutions, get and gather support for community consensus, and then forward that down to the city for implementation. But I think, without going crazy, there is an opportunity for planning groups to talk and develop positions and develop solutions, and then get the city to actually implement those. I mean, I'll be brief because I want um, Bill Fulton to, to speak to this, but I mean, I mean yeah, it's your guiding, your guiding document for the future, so if you don't put any parks or you don't put any multi-family housing, you're not going to probably get any senior housing, so how are you going to care for the um, If you don't allow for institution facilities in a plan, then you're not going to get, I mean, you could, you have to go through a longer process, it's, uh, and it usually gets more complicated and more um, in the future, whereas if you plan now, then people know what to expect going forward. But that's sort of my perspective. Put on the spot. All right. Uh, Thank you. This is what I was afraid of when the council member says, I'm going to speak only briefly because I want to hear what Joel is. And I'm going to try to answer this question in a, not a very wonky way, although I might fail. Uh, I think there's a pro and a con. Uh, Joe was really good at describing, if you're a neighborhood activist, the pros and cons of a community plan. The pro is it is a representative of the community, of the neighborhood as a whole, and it is officially recognized by the city. The con is it operates, <laughs> the con is it's, it's officially recognized by the city, <laughs> which means it operates under rules that are essentially set by the city council, yeah. and it operates under the Brown Act, right? So, so, um, uh, as Joe said, at present, the council policy that sets up the, the community planning groups essentially charges the community planning groups with dealing with community planning, which mostly means land use and, and, and infrastructure investment. Um, there's a, there's an, I think there's an argument for sticking to that. Um, uh, that's a definable thing. Uh, the big social and economic issues that were posed in the question, I, I think David did a good did a good job of showing how in the context of land use planning and public investment those can be addressed. Um, for example, uh, but those big social and economic issues go far beyond, uh, 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 far beyond land use planning and public investment. I, one of the things that we're doing, as we can reassure you to know, is that we're working on the economic development strategy, which I promise you will get sometime soon. <laughs> but, that has a wide range of policies in it, most of which have nothing to do with land use, but preserving prime, prime industrial land in order to accommodate the colleague officers below. So I think there's overlap. I think there's, a, I think there's a little bit of a danger in trying to broaden the charge to make it about everything. Uh, and I think there's, a, particularly given um, the boxed-in procedural nature of community planning groups, there's probably an advantage to kind of sticking to the knitting uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and, and the, advantage, the advantage of everybody else in the world, as Joe pointed out, is, is it is by no means your only avenue or outlet for neighborhood advocacy, right? There are ascending of us plus a wide range of advocacy groups, right? Green works for one, Georgia works for one, that, um, that, that, advocate, that have much greater freedom to advocate on a much wider range of issues in a much more freewheeling way. So, so I would suggest that probably it's better for the community planning groups to, to stick to the charge given them by the city as they are in a bit of a box and, and not stray too far outside. Okay, so we'll look forward to seeing the, um, what happens at CPC vis-a-vis the planning department later. So, um, we, we need to pack up and get out of here, so I just want